In the 18th century, Britain began to prosper like never before. Trade with the colonies brought wealth and parliamentary democracy created stability for the new leisured middle classes. The bloody wars between Catholics and Protestants were over. It was the age of reason. The church, led by men of unsure faith, became increasingly irrelevant in the face of a sceptical world, and underneath a fashionable surface, Britain was a violent nation of unruly mobs and binge drinking, with an economy built on the miseries of slavery. In 1703, in the North Lincolnshire Fens, a boy was born to Susanna, wife of Samuel Wesley, rector of Epworth Parish Church. John was their second son and fifteenth child, and when he was six years old, a fire tore through the rectory, and John was only just saved. His father took the rescue as a sign that God meant great things for the boy, a brand plucked from the burning. From age five, John was homeschooled by his mother, and then enrolled at Charterhouse, before going up to Oxford at 17. After graduating, he served as a curate in a country parish before being ordained priest in 1729. The following year, aged 26, he returned to Oxford to lecture in Greek, philosophy and logic. There he joined a club, started by his younger brother Charles, which met for Bible study and prayer. They encouraged each other in their university responsibilities. They took communion together every week and ordered their lives with great discipline. They also visited the sick and prisoners and organized classes for poor children. All was done under John's leadership in a most methodical manner. They were dubbed the Holy Club or Methodists. John resolved to let nothing hinder him from prayer. In 1732, Colonel James Edward Oglethorpe invited the Oxford Methodists to act as missionaries to the new colony of Georgia. John relished the opportunity to learn the true meaning of the gospel by preaching it to the heathen, the nobly savage American Indians. On December the 10th, 1735, John and his brother Charles set sail with 112 colonists to help the cause of religion. Every day at 4 a.m. they would rise to pray, a habit John was to keep to the end of his life. Then from 5 to 7 they read the Bible together before leading the other passengers in prayer. Two years later, Wesley left Georgia to return to England, a disappointed and disillusioned man. I went to America to convert the Indians, he wrote, but oh, who shall convert me? In the winter of 1735, John and Charles Wesley set sail for America. The voyage was stormy, and like many of his English fellow passengers, John had a great fear of the sea. During the third and most violent storm, he saw that while the English screamed in terror, 26 Germans sang psalms unafraid as the elements raged about them. The Germans were Moravian Christians, refugees escaping religious persecution in Europe. They had an assurance of faith that Wesley could only dream of. The Moravians were spiritual descendants of Jan Hus. Driven from their homeland and scattered during the Thirty Years' War, a few had survived and settled in Saxony on the estate of Count Zinzendorf. The colony was Hanhut, the Lord's Watch. Hanhut became a haven for refugees from all over Europe, and each had their own traditions. In time, the community became deeply divided and almost fell apart, but on August the 13th, 1727, the fire of Pentecost fell, and the Holy Spirit made them one. They embraced each other in tears, and out of the ashes of resentment rose the unity of the Moravian brothers. There they started a prayer meeting, which ran continuously for a hundred years. The day after Wesley landed in Georgia, he met Moravian Bishop Spangenberg, who asked him, Do you know Jesus Christ? Wesley could only reply, I know he is the Savior of the world. Spangenberg pressed him, But do you know he has saved you? Wesley answered, 
I hope he has died to save me. Wesley's mission to the colony ended in near scandal and disaster. He fell in love with a girl but lacked the courage to marry her, or perhaps had the good sense not to. She soon married another man who sued him for a thousand pounds because he refused to admit them to communion. Wesley returned home a disillusioned man. Back in London and tempted to give up preaching altogether because of his lack of faith, he met a Moravian leader named Peter Burla. Burla counseled him, preach faith until you have it and then because you have it you will preach faith. A few months later, on May the 24th, 1738, Wesley went, very unwillingly, to the meeting of a religious society in Aldersgate Street. As someone read from Martin Luther's preface to the Book of Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed and realized that he did trust Christ. He had assurance of faith at last. That experience was the turning point of revival. What happened in that little room ultimately had more impact on England than all the military victories of a hundred years. In May 1738, John Wesley had an experience that transformed him from a man struggling to live a life useful to God into the man God could use. I felt my heart strangely warmed, he wrote. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins and saved me from the law of sin and death. In his journal for the 1st of January 1739, he records a meeting which he attended with his brother Charles and George Whitfield, one of the original Oxford Methodists. The power of God came mightily upon us. Many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. John visited Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians in Hanhut, he learnt much from them, but later broke with the group over aspects of their teaching. But now apparently, because of his associations and his enthusiasm, he found churches closed to him. Soon he embraced the world as his parish. In 1739, John went to Kingswood, near Bristol, to take over from Whitfield, who was about to leave for Georgia. Also excluded from the churches, Whitfield had pioneered a new approach to announcing the gospel preaching outdoors. Wesley, reluctantly at first, did the same thing. The practice went against his every instinct, but he submitted himself to be more vile, as he put it, and began preaching a simple message aimed at working people. It was a great success, and he began building a meeting house in Bristol, which was completed in 1745. Meanwhile, Wesley started traveling around the country, proclaiming the love of God and salvation free for all by faith. He covered 5,000 miles a year on horseback, usually preaching twice a day. As people gathered to hear him, they formed themselves into societies, which were in turn divided into bands and classes for discussion and support. At the time of his death in 1791, there were 70,000 Wesleyan Methodists in England, and another 65,000 in America. He published more than 400 books, including his sermons, hymns, and journals. He preached salvation and sanctification by faith. He emphasized individual free will. He proclaimed the authority of scripture and responsibility to help those in need. In 1751, Wesley married the widowed Mary Vazil, but it was not a happy match. She disliked his mobile way of life and grew jealous. In 1771 she left him, but he carried on preaching regardless. John Wesley never intended to start a new denomination. Throughout his life he remained a priest in the Church of England. He tried to reform the church, but instead brought revival to the nation, and his Methodist circuit preachers helped spark the Great Awakening in America. Aged 88, as he lay dying, Wesley turned to his friends and said, the best of all, God is with us.